like to end our conferences, and we've done this the last few years, with a session called Personal Stories about the impact of vaccine preventable diseases um, on people's lives. So I am really honored, I am truly, truly honored to have the privilege of introducing these next speakers. They are brave and they are courageous and they're here to share their very, very powerful stories about how vaccine preventable diseases have impacted their lives and the lives of their families. Our first presenter is Julie. She is the co-founder and president of Ian's Rainbow Flu Foundation. You'll see it on her very green, wonderful shirt. Ian's Rainbow Flu Foundation is a nonprofit, volunteer-based organization established in 2004, and it is made up of families and friends of the Moyes family. As a mother of four, Julie knows personally how important it is to vaccinate children against influenza. On December 2000, in December of 2003, Julie and her husband lost their six and a half month old son, Ian, to influenza. Julie has now dedicated herself to educating others about the seriousness of influenza and the importance of annual flu vaccinations, particularly for children. Julie was also on the board of Families Fighting Flu and worked with the American Lung Association on their Faces of Influenza campaign. Julie, thank you for being here to share your story. First, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a couple of quiet years. Um, it's a hard story to share, but I think it's an important story to share. And um, with COVID, as you all know, there wasn't a whole lot of conferences to share at. So I am the co-founder of Ian's Rainbow Flu Foundation. Um, my husband and I started the organization with family and friends after we lost Ian. Um, right now, Ian's Rainbow Flu Foundation is currently working with Vaccinate Your Family, who um, put us in touch so that I could come here and share our story. And a new thing that's coming up is we are going to start working with the USA Boxing Federation. We've worked with Families Fighting Flu, the American Lung Association Faces of Influenza Campaign, the Mid-America Immunization Coalition, the Missouri Advisory of Immunization Practices, and um, I've shared my story with multiple breastfeeding support groups to let these new mamas know what's kind of going on and um, ways to protect their babies. And um, any media or organization that ever wants us to share the story, I am more than happy um, to do so. So we've been very fortunate to be able to keep Ian's memory alive and hopefully to be helping people prevent what we have gone through. Um, so the first thing I am going to do, and most of you already know all this, but um, introduce you to my son Ian. This was about um, six weeks before we lost him to complications of the flu. As you all know, the flu is a serious illness that prior to COVID killed more Americans every year than all other vaccine preventable diseases combined. Influenza, or like we like to call it, the flu, is a highly contagious viral infection of the respiratory tract. The flu is often confused with the common cold, but the flu symptoms tend to develop quickly, usually one to four days after a person is exposed, and are usually more severe than the typical sneezing and congestion associated with the cold. And here we've listed out, which I won't go over with all of you because I'm sure you're all aware, um, some of the symptoms associated with influenza. Um, I was trying to update all these um, statistics and so check with a trusted healthcare provider to make sure I have them all correct. Um, on average, as many as 36,000 Americans die each year from influenza. The year we lost Ian, which was the 2003-2004 flu season, that number rose to over 67,000 Americans dying of the flu, and they didn't even consider it a pandemic year. Um, on average, 200 to 400,000 people are hospitalized every year to the flu. The combination of the flu and pneumonia is the seventh leading cause of death in our children under the age of 13. And on average, 100 children die from influenza every year. About half of them are otherwise healthy. Now that might not seem like a huge number, but if yours is one of the 100, let me tell you it is. 
The CDC and prevention recommends everyone over six months of age and older should get their flu vaccine. It's safe. You can't get the flu from the vaccine. The flu shot and the nasal spray are made with dead and weakened virus, and they do not cause the flu. Um, if you do hate the shots, you can still find the nasal vaccine. Not as easy as it was, but you can still find it. Um, I'm not really going to go over this a whole lot because, once again, you guys all know the story. Get vaccinated. Wash your hands. Stay home if you don't feel well. I like to call it the vampire cough because my kids were small when all this started in our family. So, you know, do the vampire cough into your arm. Try not to touch your eyes, nose, and mouth and clean or disinfect objects. And when my kids were young and we had a child after we lost Ian, I'll tell you what, I put everything in my dishwasher. You would not believe how many toys are safe going through your dishwasher. Now I'm gonna share my story. Now that you've heard the statistics, I would like to share with you that um, almost, oh my goodness, it's been almost 20 years we lost our son Ian to complications of the flu in less than 30 hours after his first symptom appeared. At his six month well baby appointment, he received his immunizations, including, including the first of his two flu vaccines. He weighed 22 pounds and was a beautiful, healthy baby boy. Let me switch, because I got a really cute picture here. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Um, since he was just at six months, he got his first of his two flu vaccines. Both of his brothers were also vaccinated that day. Less than two weeks later, Ian woke up from his morning nap around 10.30 and he vomited. It was nothing alarming. I called the pediatrician's office to see at what age you could give Pedialyte in case he threw up again. I wanted to make sure he didn't get dehydrated. They asked if I wanted him to be seen and you know, he's my third one, so of course I said no. Um, about an hour later, I did call back though, and I said he wasn't acting like himself, and I had changed my mind and would like for him to be looked at. By the time we were seen about five o'clock that evening, his temperature had risen to 102 degrees. He had also started panting a little. Our doctor examined Ian and concluded that he did have the flu. Um, we were told to treat the symptoms and keep him hydrated. We were also told if, he didn't, if we did not see improvement to go ahead and take him back in to be seen. We left the office feeling somewhat confident in what we had heard. As the evening wore on, Ian's panting did not improve even when his fever would go down. My husband Glenn and I were still concerned about his breathing so I called a nurse hotline. We were told that the panting is normal with the fever. This really didn't calm our fear so we called our pediatrician's office. The doctor on call suggest we take Ian to be looked at again that evening. By this time, it's 10.30 at night. I quickly loaded Ian into the car and hurried to the Children's Pediatric Urgent Care Center close to our home. When we got there, his fever was now over 104 degrees. They ordered the nasal swab test to check for RSV and influenza. The test came back that Ian did not have RSV, but did test positive for the flu. When the doctor told me the test results, you know, I'm a mother of three, and I said, oh, it's just the flu, we can handle that. And I was so relieved that it was not RSV. I again um, was told that the panting is normal with a fever, um, and I asked about his temperature, and I was reassured not to worry unless it reached 105, and he was about six and a half months old. The doctor told me to take Ian home, keep him hydrated, and to treat his symptoms, and little did we know that night that just the flu was going to change our lives forever. That night, Ian did not want to lie in his crib to sleep. I held him in my arms so he could rest. Around 2 a.m., I started to feel feverish and achy. I also started to run a fever. In the morning, Glenn helped to get our other two sons, Sean and Ryan, ready for school. And by this time, I am feeling terrible. Glenn told me to go ahead and get some rest and he would stay with Ian. Ian's fever went down during this time, and we thought he was getting better. After my nap, Glenn took off for work, and we thought our beautiful baby boy was on his road to recovery. Ian's temperature was now down to less than 100 degrees. His panting had turned into a sigh. He wasn't taking his bottle very well, and I was worried again about him getting dehydrated, so I called the doctor's office and left a message on the triage line. 
I started giving him Pedialyte and medicine or, and water through a syringe just so he wouldn't get dehydrated. Um, when I finally talked to the nurse, she said that was fine to do. Well, meanwhile, I'm feeling worse. My fever's up to 103 degrees, and I called my husband crying and asked if he could come home just so I could crawl into bed. He said he would. I laid on the floor, and I placed Ian in a bouncy seat next to me, even though he was pretty big for a six-month-old. And, um, but he was more comfortable sitting up than he was laying flat, and I was afraid I would fall asleep while I was holding him. He napped a little, and he would sigh, and I kept patting him and telling him, I know, sweetie, Mommy doesn't feel good either. About 45 minutes later, Glenn got home, and he went over to Ian's bouncer, and he said, Hey, little buddy, and Ian opened his eyes and looked at his daddy. He also grabbed Glenn's thumb. It's a game that they used to play, and Glenn would put his thumbs out, and Ian would hold on to him, and, you know, they would oogle and Google at each other, and it was just the cutest little thing. Um, about the time that Ian was grabbing onto Glenn, our phone rang. It was the doctor's office calling back, and Glenn and I, Glenn picked up Ian and said he didn't like the way Ian looked. He said he wanted to take him to the hospital. I told the nurse that we were going to take Ian and get him looked at. Glenn then noticed that Ian's fingertips were turning blue. As soon as he said this, Ian stopped breathing. I hung up on the nurse, and I immediately called 911. Glenn said, we're, let's go. We're not going to wait because we only live a few minutes from the hospital. We jumped into our truck, and I began giving Ian rescue breathing. Ian wasn't responding. I told Glenn to stop at the fire station that's only a few blocks away. Thankfully, the firefighters were there, and they immediately started CPR. The ambulance met us at the fire station in less than five minutes, and the paramedics started working on Ian. I remember talking to one of the firemen while the others worked on him, and he was just lying there so still on their table. After several minutes, they carried Ian out to the ambulance. It seemed like an eternity before they left for the hospital. They would not let Glenn or I ride with them. I knew this was not a good sign, and I called my sister while we were on the way to the hospital. Once we arrived at the hospital, I jumped out of the truck, and I ran into the emergency room. Glenn and I were not allowed to go in the room with Ian. They brought two chairs and asked us to sit outside the trauma room. They closed the curtains so we could not see what, what they were doing. I noticed everyone's feet just standing around the gurney. I asked why the staff wasn't moving. At that time, ER was like the show to be watching, and I was a Thursday night regular. And when you watch ER, everyone's always running, and nobody was running. Then I looked over, and I could see the firemen that had been working on Ian, and they were in the trauma room with him. They also looked sad. Why? Ian was going to be fine. He just had the flu. My sister arrived at the hospital. Now the three of us sat outside Ian's room, waiting, just waiting. What was taking so long? Ian just had the flu. When the doctor walked out, he did not even have to say a word. I saw it in his eyes. I knew Ian was gone. I fell to my knees. How? He just had the flu. I ran into the room, and the nurse pulled me out. How could this be? He just had the flu. Our pastor arrived with many members of our family, and we all had to say goodbye to this beautiful baby who just had the flu. As I was rocking Ian and trying to memorize every detail of his face, one of the nurses came in and told my sister and I that we needed to come outside to see a rainbow. A rainbow? Who cares? <laughs> my baby just died of the flu, and after she promised to rock Ian and give him back to me, I reluctantly went with my sister to witness the most beautiful rainbow I have ever seen. My son was going home. Later that night, we had someone from the health department come by to test me for influenza, and I tested positive. Two days later, my husband got sick. When we were at the cemetery picking out our baby's gravesite, my husband got the news he too, had been test he too had tested positive for the flu. Neither one of us had gotten vaccinated against influenza. We thought Ian must have had some underlying health condition because healthy children don't die from influenza. We were wrong. Unfortunately, we were not aware of how serious influenza truly can be. We established a foundation in Ian's memory, Ian's Rainbow Flu Foundation, to help educate people about the seriousness of influenza and to, to excuse me, provide vaccine clinics. I had several people call me about an organization called Families Fighting Flu. 
I turned on CNN and I saw the stories. I immediately went to the website and I could not believe what I was seeing. And I w another cute picture. Um, there were these beautiful little faces and they had all died of the flu. I knew I wanted to get involved and to educate people and make them aware of how serious this can be and ways to help prevent people going through what we had gone through. Katie Belovich, three and a half years old. Marquise Jackson, five and a half months old. Amanda Kanowitz, four and a half years old. Emily Lassinger, three and a half years old. Martin McGowan, 15 years old. Brianne Palmer, 15 months old. Jessica Stein, four and a half year old. Elena Yakich, three and a half years old. Their families all have a story. They were all healthy children and they all died from the flu. When I was sent a copy of this backdrop, I looked at the angels pictured on it. What adorable looking kids. What could they have been? Nurses, doctors, scientists. They all could have held the most important job, job of all. Moms and dads with precious ones of their own but that won't ever happen. My attention was then drawn to the empty squares. How many more pictures are we gonna have to ha add? I have a story. The flu vaccine can help our children stay free of influenza and stop the spread of the virus to our families and communities. I encourage everyone to get a flu vaccination so that their story could end happier than ours. I also would like to share this is the the rainbow that we saw the day that Ian passed. Um, a friend knew we were at the hospital and just happened to have a disposable camera in her car, and she took this having no idea that we had just lost Ian. Um, my question was, how is he going to, you know, how is he going to be? He's going to be all alone, and sometimes, if you know me, I'm a little stubborn, bullheaded. So God had to show me he's not alone. Um, this was the first part of December, right before we lost him. And those are my other two boys. And since losing Ian, we've added a girl to the family. So that's been an experience there. One of the most important things that we learned through all of this is not just how serious influenza is, but how we all need to get vaccinated against us or against the flu. We've got a next speaker. Her name is Ashley Baker. She has been an optician for over 20 years. She is 37 years old now and the middle child of five siblings, which I have one brother and I cannot imagine any more than that. She lives in Washington, Missouri with her husband and her 15-year-old daughter. Her daughters travel softball in the spring and summer, keeps their family very busy. Ashley, thank you for being with us. My name is Ashley. I live in Washington with my husband and my daughter. Um, I met my husband in 2014. We, were, we married in um, April 22nd of 2017. About a month and a half after just getting married is when I found the lump in my neck. I thought this is weird and wasn't super worried right off the bat. I went to a doctor where he told me it was just an ear infection. <clears throat> and that the lump was a swollen lip node due to the air infection. So he started me on a round of antibiotics and told me after a couple weeks it will go away. So I took the two weeks of antibiotics and still had the lump. At this point, I started to get pretty nervous and was convinced something was wrong. I was biting my nails till they were bleeding, and one Sunday we were at my daughter's softball game. My husband saw me and noticed they were bleeding and said, that is it, we are going to the ER after this game, and you are going to hear from another doctor that this is not what you think it is. So we went, and my blood pressure was 232 over 136. My head was killing me. It felt like a sledgehammer was pounding it. The ER doctor looked at my ears and said, they're still red. 
and gave me more antibiotics, even asking him just to do a scan to ease my mind. <clears throat> he said, take these antibiotics and it will take a couple months for the lump to go away. Remind you, I never had one bit of ear pain this whole time. I left there still not satisfied and still very nervous. Also, a lot of my family was wishing I would just listen to these two doctors and quit thinking it was what I was thinking the whole time. It really tested our marriage right off the bat with just being married for a month and a half. So here goes two weeks. I had finished those antibiotics and I told my husband, I'm finding a new doctor and demanding a scan. So there I go finding a new PCP and I saw him, he said, I don't think it is what you think it is, but I will call you a scan in to ease your mind. So I went for the T CT scan, and sure enough, the next day he called with the news of what I was fearing the whole time. Finally, two months of living with this lump, knowing in my head what it was, but no one wanted to listen or take the time to actually check, I went for the biopsy and PET scan to determine the main spot and type. I ended up having it on my right tonsil, which was the main source, and went to one lymph node. I, I had surgery, which, which consisted of a right neck dissection and a tonsillectomy. They took out, which, I don't, do you have, nope, not that one. There's the neck dissection, and then they did a tonsillectomy, <clears throat> same day. And then two drain tubes I wore for a week. And then, now I gotta figure out where it was. I ended up having it on, I had surgery. They took out 28 lymph nodes and other things. Saliva gland, a muscle, a bunch of stuff in there. <clears throat> the ENT that did the surgery was determined with my age of only being 32 to send it off and was hopeful that it was the disease because of the cure rate for it to be HPV. When he called me, he said he was hopeful that it is from the virus because of the cure rate being so good. After healing from surgery, I had to have a couple wisdom teeth pulled before, before I gain, began radiation. Once you have radiation to your mouth, they say having a tooth pulled is not a quick process and usually consist of hyperbaric oxygen chamber treatments to get it to heal after a tooth pulling. I then had six and a half weeks of radiation to my neck and throat. So then the next picture was them making the mask, which was definitely not fun. That one, they bolted the mask pretty much from here up. That was six and eight. That was the soft one. Then they made a hard one. It was pretty brutal. I lost complete taste about a week into radiation, and it was gone for about six months after I was done. Still to this day, I like more spicy food, and meat is harder to eat. Definitely need water to get it down easier. I did manage to keep working through radiation and didn't need the heavy pain meds like my radiologist said I would more than likely need. My husband wanted me to take off, but I thought, why sit at home and lay around? It might make me feel worse. My last treatment was November 22nd, 2017, which was the day before Thanksgiving. Even though I could not taste anything, my family had a cake and some gifts for me to celebrate the end of treatment. It was definitely a great day to be thankful. I took a four month break to let all the radiation exit out and then had a final PET scan and got the all clear. My radiologist even called me on a Saturday since I had the scan on a Friday to tell me the great news. He knew, just like every other cancer patient, how real Scanxiety is. And I was <clears throat> really anxious since it was my first one since finishing everything. I am now five and a half years out and doing good. I honestly didn't know much about the vaccine or the disease. The vaccine came out in 2006, which by that point I was already 21. Since my cancer had happened, I learned all about it. 
My daughter was still only 10, so when she came old enough for the vaccine, she definitely got them. I also have shared my story with my friends and their kids and my family, so they were all aware of this and how it is preventable. No reason to have to deal with lifelong pain from radiation, dry mouth, and many, many other things just by getting the vaccine and making sure our kids are safe as well. I think if people knew how common this virus is, it would be an eye-opener, that is for sure. The vaccine not only can prevent throat cancer like what I had, but also anal, cervical, vaginal, penile, and other cancers. Does not mean it will turn to cancer, but why take the risk? With a vaccine, you can make sure your family is safe. I do know usually cancer from this virus usually does show up, does not show up till in the 50s, according to my doctors. We have one more speaker today. I'm gonna invite up Kim. Kim is our final speaker, and she is one of the founding members of the Howard Aislinger Foundation, established in 2009. Kim, along with her sisters and mother, started this foundation in memory of her father, Howard, who was confined to a wheelchair due to having polio at 11 years old. Born and raised in Cape Girardeau, Kim is the co-owner of the Missouri Running Company. The foundation's primary fundraiser is a 24-hour endurance run, encouraging runners and walkers to follow Howard's phrase. It's not a handicap, it's an inconvenience. The foundation provides scholarships to individuals with disabilities, as well as supporting the ACE athletes, allowing those with disabilities to be active in sports. Kim, welcome. Hi, my name is Kim Kelpie, and I am one of three daughters of Howard Aislinger. He was married to our mom, Jean Aislinger, for 40 years and had three children, Shelley Kirchhoff, Carrie Simon, and myself. He had eight grandchildren. Our father, Howard, was born in 1940 and was a very active young boy. In 1952, he came down with what was believed to be the flu. As most parents, his took him to the doctor and was told, yes, you have the flu, and send him home. However, as time went on, his symptoms did not improve to the point that his fever was so high he was having possible hallucinations, and they returned to the doctor. After what seemed like an eternity, he was eventually diagnosed with polio. With this diagnosis, our dad had to spend a significant amount of time in the hospital as a young boy. Keep this in mind as you think about your own 11 and 12 year old children. According to the CDC, the disease reached its peak incidence in the United States in 1952, with 20,000 cases of paralytic poliomyelitis and more than 3,000 deaths nationwide. The vast majority of polio survivors did not have symptoms or just had minor cases that looked like muscle pain or the flu. Only a few who got polio developed meningitis or had paralysis in their arms or legs. While our dad rarely talked about his time in the hospital, especially with his daughters, he did at times talk about remembering seeing the iron lung, um, waking up to a new roommate in the middle of the night as his previous one had passed away, and lots of ice cream. For the longest time after his lengthy stay, even, even shortly before, he would rarely have ice cream because when he was in the hospital, when his parents were able to come visit, or oftentimes just being a patient, they were offered ice cream, thinking it would make the sick kids feel better. There is no cure for polio. It can only be prevented. The polio vaccine, given multiple times, can protect a child for life. The two vaccines available, the oral and the inactivated polio vaccine. The inactive being what is currently used in the US. Both are effective and safe, and both used in different combinations worldwide, depending on local epidemiological and pragmatic circumstances to ensure the best possible protection to populations can be provided. Once released from the hospital, my dad was unable to walk on his own and was in a wheelchair. At times, in his younger years, while in his home and going just short distances, he was able to use crutches 
from all of my memories, I never remember being able to see him use those. His parents tried everything to get him to be able to walk again, including taking him to multiple religious healers. Just a few years later, in 1955, Salk's inactivated vaccine was licensed. This was licensed after he first tested on his own family in 1953. By 1957, just five short years later, the cases of polio had dropped from 58,000 to 5,600. Salk did not profit from sharing formulation or production processes, and he was once asked who owned the patent, and his response was the people. When the vaccine was out, my grandparents made sure that my dad vaccinated, thinking that maybe, possibly, it would help with some of his paralysis. Although polio affected his walking, he did not let it affect his life. He continued his education, and I'm sure got into his fair share of trouble. When he turned 16, vehicles were not easily accessible for those who could not use their legs. So his brother-in-law helped him by making and installing hand controls in his car so he could drive. This was only the start of his inconvenience, not slowing him down. While I'm not sure when this became his mindset, it is what he taught his daughters daily and anyone else who knew him. He made it clear that just because he could not use his legs any longer, he was not handicapped, he was merely inconvenienced. I like to think that this was his mindset from the beginning and one of the reasons I had the pleasure of calling him my dad. His motto was, it's not a handicap, it's an inconvenience. He carried this motto with him throughout his life and taught his daughters that we could do anything if we tried. My dad went on to live a very fulfilling life. He married, had three daughters, he had a very successful career as an insurance agent, and he did this for 32 years. He coached his daughters and many of their friends and peers in basketball, soccer, and softball. He was active in Rotary and JCs. He welcomed several exchange students, foster children, family, and even friends into his home. He helped to get the Cape Area Youth Soccer Association started and was president of this for several years. He was also very influential in getting the high school soccer programs in the Southeast Missouri region. All three of us will tell you that he was the best dad and coach that we could ask for. And still to this day, people who he coached talk about how amazing he was. He may not have been able to play these sports, but he knew everything there was to know and knew how to get the best out of all of his athletes. He enjoyed his life, and he helped others by letting them see that joy. Later in life, he started experiencing issues. Some of these issues were due to being in a wheelchair for his life and the effect on, the, on his organs. Many of these issues that arise were due to post-polio syndrome. Post-polio syndrome affected his muscles, including those around his lungs, which led to breathing issues. Once his breathing issues became too bad, he ended up in the hospital. After a significant time and having to be put on a vent, he came home on hospice. My dad, Howard Aislinger, passed away June 16th, 2009, four days before his 69th birthday with all of his family by his side. After his death, together, my sisters and my mom wanted to do something to keep his memory alive. He was always very active in the community and he loved to give back. He always said that he wanted individuals with disabilities to be able to do whatever they put their mind to, and he wanted them to have the opportunities that he may not have had. So we started the Howard A. Slinger Memorial Scholarship Foundation. We provide scholarships to individuals with disabilities so they can further their education. After a few years, we added to the scholarship in honor of his love for sports, and we incorporated ACE athletes. ACE athletes helps those who need help pursuing their athletic endeavors. This has ranged from swim lessons, to racing chairs, to even helping someone with a rewalk. Um, the rewalk is a battery-powered exoskeleton with motors at the hips and knees. The rewalk controls movement using changes in a person's center of gravity, and repeated body shifting helps mimic a functional natural gait of the legs. To date, the foundation has donated over $100,000 to help individuals further their education and over $25,000 to adaptive athletes. Our main fundraiser for the foundation is the Howard H. Slinger 12 and 24 hour run. 
This event takes place in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, the third weekend of March. Starting at 7 p.m. on Friday night, runners inconvenience themselves by running or walking to see how many miles they can get in their designated time. At 7 a.m., a fresh set of runners start the 12-hour day. The whole idea is for participants and the family that is working the event to inconvenience themselves. If dad could inconvenience himself his whole life, people can do it for 12 or 24 hours. What started as a small group has ended up being a pretty amazing event. There are always people there that will get big mileage, many going over 100 miles, and some who come to do their first marathon or half marathon or just walk a few laps. But what is really great is seeing people inconvenience themselves to hit what is a huge accomplishment for them. One of the most amazing things that we got to see was a past wheelchair participant complete 167 miles in his racing chair. He then came back a few years later and used this, the rewalk that we donated some funds through ACE Athletes to help him get and walked a lap. It was very emotional to the family and I know dad would have loved to see this and even had the chance to use one of these himself. And I would suggest if you've never seen a rewalk to look it up, it's really an amazing thing. When my parents decided to have children, it was extremely important to my dad especially that his were vaccinated. He did not want any child, much less his own, to have to experience what he did as a young boy in the hospital and after once paralyzed. While he chose to have a positive outlook on life, despite paralytic polio, he was a strong advocate of all vaccinations. That belief was passed down to his children and eventually to their children. Although we do not hear about polio often, it is still not fully eradicated worldwide. My hope is that not only polio vaccines, but all vaccines can be readily available and encouraged worldwide to help move closer to eradication in all vaccine preventable diseases. As you can see from the brief review of my dad's life, he did not let the lack of a vaccine available and getting polio dampen his life. He lived a life that most people can only dream of. He did not let his inconvenience stop him. As an athlete, a wife, a mother, and a business owner, I do not have as much medical knowledge as many. What I do have is an awareness of what can happen without them. Losing my dad shortly after becoming a mother has always made me think, if the vaccine had come out five years earlier, maybe, just maybe, my dad, Howard A. Slinger, would still be here. Thank you.